busy schedules to be with us. This is the third the third briefing, donor briefing that we've had. Just a little background, we started donor briefings probably a year or two ago for foundation donors as a way to emphasize that we think that um, in addition to other services that we provide people in the community that the knowledge that the foundation has amassed in its, in its job over its 90 or 89 years uh, can be helpful to people. And so we've tried to, we're doing a lot more work in um, developing the knowledge and disseminating the knowledge through a variety of vehicles, events, our website, issue briefs and things like that. So we had the bright idea to extend that to the Community Fund for Women and Girls this year and we're delighted that you're with us here today. Um, and it's my I, it's my job to actually do ask you to make introductions as we go around the table. So, Jolynn, sure. would you? My name is Jolynn Walker, and I work here at the Community Foundation. I'm the administration officer. I've been here for 12 years and really enjoy it. But through my 12 years, I've gained so much knowledge that I think it was this year that I started to find myself. Mm -hmm. And Jolynn, maybe you could add what you'd like to learn tonight. Oh, what I'd like to learn. What um, would like to talk about? Well, I saw something about disenfranchisement. Now, I hear about it in the southern states and what that might mean, but what does that mean here um, in Fort Connecticut? Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Uh, I'm Shelley Sosinski. I'm the former chair of the Fund for Women and Girls, former Community Foundation board member. Um, former member of the advisory and grants committees for the Fund for Women and Girls, a donor to Women and Girls, and I have a big quest in my girl to the Fund for Women and Girls. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> Hit every checkbox. You, you can tell I have an interest in this. <laughs> and I don't know what I want to learn tonight. Okay. Uh, my name is Felicia Gelman. I'm a resident psychiatrist at Yonam Human Hospital. I'm a former member of the NARAL PAC board up in Hartford, the Connecticut chapter. Um, I'm interested in how gender influences um, the treatment of mental health patients, uh, gender sexuality, the intersection of that. And so um, this is my first community fund um, for women and girls event. So I'm looking forward to learning more about what uh, this is. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lexi Crampton. I just moved to New Haven two weeks ago. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> um, I work at All Our Twin with Carmen, um, and I'm just kind of eager to hear more about what all you guys Hi, I'm Carmen Roman Gonzalez. I worked for All I Can Early Head Start with Lexi, and um, this is my first event for the Women and Girls, so I'm just here to, to learn and right. Also, I see Dr. Brown all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just like, hey, I gotta go see her. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barbara Ellinghouse. I'm a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley and a longtime New Haven resident. I'm a founding mother of the Fund for Women and Girls. Wow. Which means yeah. Like, oh, yeah, which where we were trying, we just really wondered if we were ever gonna raise a million dollars. Mm -hmm. That was like a long way off, but now we're, that's way behind us, so that's very cool. I'm a little terrified of what Dr. Brown Jean is gonna say today. I have a couple of friends who are lawyers who've talked about the disenfranchisement issue. It's really scary. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm Ratasha Smith. I'm a communications officer here. I'm super crazy about politics and things like that, so I'm just very interested in what might be talked about today. Doing there. Oh, and this is a Facebook Live feed. Yeah, so we're doing so this yeah. Hi, I'm Ann Diamond. Um, I'm a resident of New Haven and a donor uh, to the foundation, at both now and as, and as in the future through a bequest. Um, I'm very politically active and very and, and have uh, suffered a lot of anxiety and upset since the election and have been trying to figure out ways to turn things around and I'm very concerned about voter suppression and and um, getting out the vote and those sorts of issues so these whatever you have to say is probably going to be something I want to hear about. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Mimi Falsey. I'm a fundraising consultant, working now, doing some work with the Community Foundation, and so I'm all ears and 
here to learn as much about, uh, about the program as what you have to say. Hi, um, I'm Brenda Carter, and um, I live here in New Haven, and I run a national project called the Reflective Democracy Campaign, which focuses on the demographics of political power nationally. Um, and uh, so this is uh, this topic is really interesting to me, and my project is also funded by the Women Donors Network, which is a national network of 200 progressive women. So my project does research and grant making and organizing. I'm Lucille Bruce. I'm a communications officer at Connecticut Mental Health Center, and I'm the co-chair of the Voter Registration Committee. Yeah. So I'm really interested in learning more, particularly about the, the intersection with gender, which we haven't really worked on. Donna Hagiga and I have my own consulting practice and have been working with the fund uh, to bring programs like these, this leadership uh, speaker series throughout the year. So I'm excited uh, to have done this. This is, I'm kind of sad that this is our last one, but I was also uh, just appointed as the CEO of the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. So I'm a little busy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Margie Pickhart, resident of New Haven, uh, interested volunteer, uh, just interested in hearing about the topic and what you have to say and what everyone else has to share about it. And I'm Ed Pickhart. Um, uh, I guess that we're a community foundation groupies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm representing uh, the other gender uh, here. Uh, I was a reti I'm a retired CPA and it went in the Peace Corps I went into the Peace Corps after retiring and in Kenya, and they just had a recent uh, presidential election that got overturned, and they're about to go through another election. Uh, so I'm interested in that. And here in New Haven, I've uh, gone through the moderator training for uh, elections, and just am interested in everyone voting. Thank you. How about Carmen? Hi, my name is Carmen Burgess, and I work um, as Associate Development Upstairs in the now DMDS <laughs> department. Uh, thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Ken Harris. I'm Vice President of Community Engagement as well as the Director of the Health and Star Program for Someone in South Initiative here at the Foundation. And I'm just happy to be in the room to hear folks talk about this particular topic. So I'm excited just to hear what all of you have to say. Hi, I'm Kathleen Che. I'm the communications officer here at the foundation, as well as like Natasha. Um, and I'm deeply full of you tonight. And I'm also very excited to hear what you have to say. So it works for me, both of us. Okay, my name is Kelly Gibson. I'm a development associate here at the foundation. And I'm also a former New Haven Promise alum. And what did you do the other weekend? <laughs> <laughs> and I recently just took the law school administration test because I want to be a lawyer now more than ever. <laughs> 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 she's she's <laughs> trying to sell us. I should be proud. I, I want to turn it over to Kalila, who is wonderful. You all, you all have said already how you followed Kalila, but she's also a board member of the foundation. We're very grateful to her for. Being, be, her service on our board and for being here today. And I'll let Sharon introduce her, but because we have a couple new people, I just want to take the opportunity to tell you about the Community Fund for Women and Girls and the Community Foundation. So the Community Fund for Women and Girls is 21 years old, it's tw almost 22. Um, it is a fund of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. And Barbara's right, we started out many years ago trying to raise some money, and now it's several millions of dollars as well as women have setting, besides the corpus of the fund itself, there are women who have set, or families, that have set up funds to benefit the community fund for women and girls in their own family uh, or individual's name. So that's, so we're doing, and Sharon give you more information about the grant making, the corpus is up, the grant making is up, and we always encourage people to consider making a gift to the community fund for women and girls when we gather like this, because it's the money that's in the fund that enables us to do programming like this. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the Community Foundation is one of the oldest and, and uh, community foundations in the nation. It started in New Haven in 1928, so we're older than the Community Fund for Women and Girls, but then we're going to be celebrating 90 years. And as I think many of you know, we do a lot of, we do two, three, couple things. 
can we help people uh, perpetuate their interest in this community by having mostly endowed funds that have people have started over many generations that benefit this area, and we that the funds benefit the area mostly through the uh, the granting of grants to nonprofits in our 20 town region, which are listed up here. Um, we because we're mostly an investment uh, endowment, we have investment uh, capability and very good investment capability. So our funds and endowment increases not only by new gifts, but by um, uh, investment performance, which we are very also very proud of. And then the thing I mentioned at the beginning is that we know that we can offer more to the community than grants and, the, and philanthropic services. So we're really, over the last couple of years, beefing up our work in creating knowledge resources that people can use to make this community better. And thus, this meeting this afternoon. So Angela, I'll try to, yes. you forgot. And, and the opportunity to talk to this group in particular about our founding mother. Oh, that, that's your yes. role. Yes. Your show is coming. I, I would just say that um, it's very important, I think, to know that yes. although the Fund for Women and Girls is much younger, the very first funder of the Community Foundation was a woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. So her name was Cindy Davy, and so we refer to her as our founding mother. And in fact, we have a very rich history, even before the fund, of women donors. Uh, many, across many generations. Yes, thank you, Nettie. <laughs> we, we call Kachelli Nettie because we do community tours, which you are all uh, also invited uh, to attend, and uh, Shelly always takes part in the <laughs> Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sharon. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sharon Capetta, and I'm the Director of Development here at the Community Foundation, and um, have the privilege and honor of working with uh, donors and individuals, and I also have the distinct privilege of staffing uh, a part of the staff team for the Community Fund for Women and Girls. And um, I really appreciate you spending your, your time here with us today. We're delighted to have Kalila with us. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Um, how many people listen to WNPR? <laughs> Miss Where We Live. <laughs> Recently, it's you been were a on, busy day. Yeah, weren't you on this morning? Yeah. Talking about hurricane relief efforts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, her interest and expertise extends beyond politics. In fact, when I googled you, uh, what, there's, there's like a folder <laughs> here. <laughs> so when I googled you, actually, you're um, very well known for your work in and your studies in the in criminal justice and reform and and, and that type of work, and um, yet you're a political commentator on WTNH and frequently called upon. So we have a multi-talented person here joining us today, and um, I know you want to hear from her. So I thought maybe Kyle, you would talk. We talk beforehand about um, what you wanted to talk about. We talked about voting and voters and gender. We talked about voter suppression. And we talked about, oh, what about right here? Mm -hmm. What about Connecticut? What do we need to know? What do we need to be doing? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll lead into you. So thanks, Angela. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It's amazing that people took this time in the middle of the week at the end of the work day to come out. Um, I will keep my remarks brief because what we also discussed is that I think when you get a group like this together, it is so much more important to hear what people have to say and what they're feeling because I don't want you to leave today feeling overwhelmed or doomed by the political landscape. So what I want us to do is to talk about what that landscape looks like, but really get to the point of what do we do now? And I think it's also important to say, because I do a lot of political commentary, I am critical of Democrats, Republicans, and all points in between. <laughs> um, so this is really about, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your political preferences, what does the landscape look like that really affects all of us and our ability to participate in the process? So here are the two guiding thoughts that I want you to keep in mind. The first is that the past is prologue. And the second is that context matters. So what do I mean by that? So let me share with you this uh, story. Two years ago, I wrote a report about the impact of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 across the board. So what's been the impact on voter registration? What has it meant for diversifying the people who represent us? And what's been the impact on policy? 
So my family and I went down to Selma, Alabama in order to present the report, and we were there for the 50th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday March. So did anyone see the movie Selma? Mm -hmm. yes. So yes. based on that march and sort of the events surrounding it, and so we were there. And I have to tell you, I'm the, the mom of a nine-year-old daughter who at the time was seven. Um, I brought her and my colleague brought his seven-year-old son. And so we were really excited because we got tickets to go to the big rally where Barack Obama was speaking, where President George W. Bush was there. This was a big deal that we got these tickets. They didn't tell us before that we had to get there three hours in advance. Yeah. So we had two little kids in the hot Alabama sun for hours waiting for the president. So while we were there, we're talking to everyone around because you know we're telling the kids, like, this is so exciting. What are you going to learn from this? My daughter starts talking to this gentleman who's standing beside us. Um, and she did what every kid does. She notices something that you don't want them to point out, but because they're <laughs> kids, they do it, right? So she says to this gentleman, sir, what's wrong with your arm? What's on your arm? And I'm like, no, don't ask. Just look the other way, you know, don't make a big deal. And he said, no, I want to talk about it. So he pulls up his sleeve and he shows her his arm. And so on his arm were scars from when he had been attacked by dogs during that march 50 years ago. Wow. So he is what that whole event was about. And there they're called freedom soldiers. And literally the crowds part because they have an escort with them that says freedom soldier coming through, freedom soldier coming through. And they wear these medals and it is this point of pride. For him. So there he was, a young man run out of Selma 50 years ago for participating in this non-violent act of civil disobedience, of speaking it out against what he sees as an injustice and being punished and ridiculed for that, of having the mayor of Selma say he shouldn't be able to graduate from high school because he participated in this, of his family being told, we'll take your land, you won't ever have a job in this area. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. right? Of doing that 50 years ago, then going into the military, becoming a veteran, honorably discharged, and coming back 50 years later. And so on that bridge, it was fascinating for me as a parent to see the kids process everything that was happening around them. So we met the family of Viola Luzo, who was shot and killed because she came from Detroit to Selma to drive people who were boycotting the buses back and forth to work and was shot and killed because they thought as a white woman coming from Detroit from the North, you have betrayed your race and you as a race trader are more detrimental to the cause than anyone else. So to be able to talk to our family. The Reverend William Barber from North Carolina, you mentioned North Carolina, I'm born and raised in Virginia. So Reverend Barber was there and to have the opportunity to say to him, thank you for what he's doing for poor people really across the country. My kid got to meet John Lewis. And she's like, Mommy, it's John Lewis. And I thought, she thinks I'm cool today. It may not last you. <laughs> That's okay. For today, we are. She also got to meet the first couple, same sex couple, to be legally married in the state of Alabama, two African American men. And so as we're participating in this march, we go toward the middle of the bridge, and Haley stops in her track. She's not moving. I'm like, kid, there are thousands of people behind us. We have to go. What's the problem? And she said, Mom, I don't know what's on the other side. <gasps> and my husband and I just stopped because I thought, here's this seven-year-old who has summed up everything that our nation was facing in the domain of voting rights, the very thing that brought us to that spot. She was able to see it in the way that the Republican and Democratic members of Congress who had come for the pageantry didn't seem to understand of what that meant. So for me, in terms of why this is such an important topic and is one that, again, should stretch across political parties, is that there is nothing more fundamental to our democracy than the ability to vote and make decisions. And so I, I feel some kind of way when I hear, um, I call them Facebook prophets, you know, the people on social media who know everything and do nothing, um, who say, oh, your vote doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're choosing the lesser of two evils. My response is kind of, well, if it's the lesser of two or the lesser of five, you have to make a choice. Um, so that's sort of the framework 
of how what we were there to honor that happened in 1965 was continuing in 2015 and really what we saw happen in 2016 and beyond. So that was the county where the original story about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 came to be. And it's also why 2016 was so important, not because Hillary Clinton was running, not because Donald Trump was running or anyone else, but it was important because it was the first presidential election since the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was weakened. Mm -hmm. So you had Barack Obama reelected in 2012. At the end of 2012 into 2013, the Supreme Court issues a decision called Shelby v. Holder. Right, so Shelby County, Alabama, where we were, was we were driving in giant Confederate flags sort of looming over the highway. That case then sets in motion what we see now. So essentially what the Supreme Court said in Shelby v. Holder was that race was a vestige of the past. But where we are today as a nation is not where we were in 1965. And essentially if we can elect an African American president, we can now say that we are post-racial. I didn't love me how that works. It's so easy, and easy right? So because of that, if you can't prove that in fact Shelby County, Alabama is still discriminating against people, then it's not fair to hold them accountable for what happened 50 years ago. So the court changed the idea that it's no longer about impact. You can't say that this provision disproportionately impacts a particular group. You have to show intent. So it's really hard to get a legislator on the record to say the purpose of this voter ID law is to make sure poor people can't vote, right? Like they're a little more savvy than that. But because the court, the Supreme Court made that decision, it then had an impact. Literally within an hour of that court decision being made, 15 new voting laws were enacted in the state of Texas. Like Texas was ready to go. States like Wisconsin, and you see the New York Times article about Wisconsin, North Carolina, northern states as well, all enacted new laws. Because it meant you no longer had to have the federal government review your policy to make sure that it did not have a discriminatory intent or impact. Right? And so we often criticize legislators for working slowly. Texas was ready to go on this one. And here's the other thing to keep in mind. Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court is John Roberts. John Roberts worked in the 1980s in the Department of Justice under the Bush administration. And his job in the 1980s was to figure out how to weaken the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and to eventually do away with that protection. So the VRA has to be reapproved by Congress every 10 years or every 15 years. So John Roberts worked on that in 1982. And people said, look, you're a failure. You didn't do it. We still have it. So it took a while, but eventually John Roberts was the presiding officer in the court so that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was gutted. What's the outcome of that? The court said, look, Congress, you go back and figure out this new form. So we're not saying discrimination doesn't happen. We're saying you have to prove it. So Congress is expected to come up with a new formula. It's not going to happen. So if you can stand beside your colleague, John Lewis, in Congress and say to him, I'm sorry that you suffered permanent brain damage on that bridge in Selma. I think it's really great that you've gone from a student who was incarcerated and left to die to now being a member of the US Congress, but I simply cannot sign on on this legislation. So that's the framework and the landscape for why the past becomes prologue in a lot of these decisions and these debates. So, Joanne, you asked this question about, um, you know, is this a Southern mm -hmm. problem? So here's why it isn't a Southern problem and why it also is not just an African-American problem. 1965, we get the Voting Rights Act, but we also get the Hart Seller Immigration Act, where LBJ says it's not fair to privilege immigrants coming from Europe and to have caps on people coming from the rest of the world. So in the same year that you affirm the importance of the vote, you also change immigration policy so you have greater numbers of people coming from Latin America and the Caribbean and Africa and parts of the Middle East that previously would have been barred from coming into the US. So 1972, Congress says, look, the US today doesn't look like what it did before. 
So we not only have to protect African Americans' ability to access the ballot, and that's not just voting, but that's also materials. We also need to think of language minorities. So we now provide language support for certain groups. So here in Connecticut, the big group are Spanish-speaking communities. So if you go to the polling place, you're supposed to be able to request the ballot in English or in Spanish. New York City provides ballots in eight different languages. Let me back up. New York City is supposed to provide <laughs> ballots in eight different languages. 2016, New York said, look, we're broke. We can't afford to do this. So we're only going to provide ballots in three languages. So if you speak Mandarin Chinese, you can either get the ballot in English or in Spanish, and you can kind of figure your way out, right? <laughs> so because the VRA and the voting rights protections cover language minorities as well, 75% of the United States is covered by some aspect of the Voting Rights Act. So places like California, of course, Texas and Florida that are fairly diverse, but also New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, that are seeing these growing trends and these growing changes. And I think the thing that is so important when we add in the layer of gender, the problem is that we see people as being a part of one group at a time. So when people, I had a friend who you know, saw the, the advertisement for this and she said, this makes no sense. The Voter Rights Act isn't about gender. How are you going to link this in? And I said, well, here's a flash. They're like black women in the US. <laughs> They're Latinas. Who knew that people can be at the intersection of identities? And so when you talk about the difference between voter disenfranchisement and voter suppression, this is where it becomes key. So you could, ask, if I were to ask you today, how many of you believe that we should have to prove who we are in order to vote? Show of hands. Yeah, I believe so, right? Makes sense, I have to show an ID in order to purchase alcohol or in order to fly. Mm -hmm. The issue isn't that we want people to prove who they are. The issue comes in a couple of things. One, how you prove who you are. So in the state of Mississippi, you cannot show your state-issued ID in order to vote. So if you're a student at Ole Miss, which is a uni state university, you can't show that student ID to vote. But you can show your gun license uh, to vote, uh, right? Where you go to get the ID matters. So if you live in metropolitan Atlanta, there are no places in metropolitan Atlanta where you can go and get a particular form of state-issued ID in order to vote. So if you live in the city of Atlanta, and if you've been there, you know it is so congested and the traffic will make you want to move elsewhere. Right? You live in the city of Atlanta and you rely on public transportation, what are your options? Well, you have to go out into the county in order to get that particular form of state-issued ID. That's a two-hour bus trip each way. Now, I really love American politics. I really love democracy. I'm not taking four hours on a bus in order to get an ID and then come back to my neighborhood to register and to be able to cast that ballot. If you're an older American and you're no longer driving, you don't have a driver's license. So what do you do? So that's where these laws that, again, on the face of them, make sense. We want to protect our democracy. We want to make sure that having access to the ballot is so key that we protect it. It sounds good in theory, but it is having an impact on the people in greatest need of political representation. So what does that mean for the kinds of things and issues that we're talking about here? Um, I'm going to mention the 2016 election because I think it was so important seeing the outcome, not in terms of who won and who lost, but in terms of who voted and for whom, right? Because it gets us to this understanding that demography is not destiny in American politics. So if you look at this chart here, right, and you see those breakdowns, and again, these are very crude um, breakdowns because we don't have full information on race and ethnicity to be able to look at the granular level as much as we would like. But here's something that when I was running the data, you know, election night, I was at WCNH, and I remember my producer coming in my ear and saying, it's all over your face. You're showing on your face. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to kind of change. So the next day, I start crunching numbers. And this is what was amazing to me. 
13% of African American men voted for Donald Trump. Not 13% of African American men who were registered Republicans, not 13% of African American men who had said they had voted Republican in the past, but 13% of African American men overall. That was fascinating to me, right? If you look at the number of women who voted, right? So white women, 52% cast their ballots for Donald Trump. <coughs> so it's why it's not as simple to say Republicans do this and Democrats do this, or women support women as candidates and African Americans support African Americans as candidates. This made it clear that the rules of the game matter and that context matters. How do the rules of the game matter? 94% of African American women cast their ballots for Hillary Clinton. And that's the piece of it that gets lost. Why? Because those new voting rights laws, those new acts of suppression and disenfranchisement have their greatest impact on communities of color. And here's the sort of non-political way that we shape the political process. So Sharon mentioned a lot of my work um, is in the, the realm of criminal justice. And my first big project was on felon disenfranchisement. So taking the right to vote or the ability to vote away from people who have been convicted of a felony. And in some states, if you've been accused, not convicted, you can lose the ability to vote. So in my home state of Virginia, if you're convicted of a felony, so don't write a bad check if you still write checks in Virginia, because you will lose the ability to vote for the rest of your life in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So that seems to be a non-political punishment. We believe people do something wrong, they should be punished. That means that on election day in November, there were over six million people who couldn't vote in that election because they had a felony conviction. Overwhelming majority of those people, African American men and Latinos. So you already are dampening the pool of people who could possibly vote. African American women outvote other groups. So across the board, African American women vote in higher numbers. Even though we saw a lower turnout across the board in 2016, black women still outvoted those groups. So when you have these provisions that limit who is first eligible, then it has an impact on who votes and also how people vote. So that if you are someone who's had someone in your family that's been affected by the criminal justice system, and you have a resentment over the way that we punish people for breaking the law, you look at Hillary Clinton as the face of the war on drugs. You look at her as the representative of policies that decimated communities across the board and across partisan affiliations. So these are the ways that the rules are having these long-term effects on people. So two things and then I'll stop talking and, and open to the group. Um, this has an impact on policy because it not only means who's voting, but it also means for whom they're voting and what those people do once they are in office. So one of the things that we know from political science 101 is that when women participate in the electoral process, they tend to support more progressive policies, right? They tend to support things like family leave. They tend to believe that the government should play a key role in supporting communities and providing social services to communities. And so that's the long-term effects of this change in voting and the Voting Rights Act that many of us who study political science are concerned about. So if you look at our state of Connecticut, who I think now the governor's saying October 15th and maybe kind of might get a budget, <laughs> what will that mean for the policies that are here? Because 2016 wasn't just about what happened with the White House. Right? It was about massive changes in our state, changes in the control of the legislature, changes in who was able to vote and participate, and how those candidates positioned themselves. And the thing for Connecticut as well in this domain, and I want to be really clear about this, um, and I try to hold my tongue when my friends say things, and I'm like, oh, that's not actually right. So Connecticut is one of those states that has closed primaries, which is, we all know, if you are not registered for a political party, you cannot vote in that primary. Connecticut has the highest percentage of voters who identify as independent compared to any state in the country. So that means we've already removed a large swath of potential voters from participating in that key first step, and that's the primary, right? 
that is not voter suppression. That is not voter disenfranchisement. It is not targeting independents because they are independents. It is saying if the Republican Party wants to control its vote choice, that's what they do. If Democrats want to do it, that's what they do. We have the opportunity to change that within our state. That's my little plug for us pushing your legislators to change the rules of the game. But it has had an impact on these policies. So if you look at the key cuts to our budget, things like mental health support, things like addiction support, school funding, all of the things that come up continuously in these conversations, it wasn't about what the change was at the federal level, it was the impact at the state and local level of changing who can participate in the process, right? So what do we do? Now that you have kind of broad strokes of this, here are a couple of things that I want you to keep in mind um, as we open for discussion. Two key events that are so important and that I think, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, we should just wait till 2020 and let's just, you know, figure out 2020. If we wait until 2020, it's too late, regardless of your political views. So next year, 2018, every member of the United States House is up for election or re-election. That means communities need to start organizing now to know what the voting laws and requirements are within your particular state. So the Secretary of uh, uh, State for Connecticut is proposing an automatic registration bill. That would mean as soon as you turn 18, you are automatically registered to vote. You have to opt out as opposed to opting in. And other states that have had that provision show that you see a dramatic increase in the number of registered voters and people who actually vote, primarily young people, people of color, senior citizens, and the poor. So you can imagine why there is a vehement opposition to automatic registration, not because people think it'll be corruption, but because it's going to change the people who have the ability to come in. So 2018 congressional elections, the race for governor here in the state of Connecticut, and to see whether that person or those people will support these kinds of voting reforms that could actually help people come into the process. The other key thing is that we're going to undergo the census very soon. Again, people need to start thinking now. So that if you are a registered voter, if you are qualified or eligible to vote, you should be pushing to get on some of those census committees and commissions for the state of Connecticut. Because you can be a part of the process of determining not just who can vote, but how we carve up districts in our state. So we're a state that has a lot of prisons. I'm surprised when I moved here. It was great for my research. Not so great for society, right? Um, surprised how many prisons we have in Connecticut, given the size of our state. But here's the thing. All of our prisons are located where? Suburbs. Suburbs. Suburbs and rural areas. We have no prisons in cities in this state. The areas that have the largest issues with crime and send the most people into prison are the cities. Why does that matter? Well, you get to count those inmates in your census, right? <laughs> Cheshire gets a disproportionate share of resources because it can inflate its population. <laughs> Infill has three prisons. So essentially, the people who are getting elected are being elected by a smaller number of people to control more resources to distribute to fewer people. That's where the rules of the game matter. And that's where everyday citizens, concerned people, need to intervene. So that it's not just about elections and electoral outcomes. It's really about the integrity of our process. So that redistricting piece, gerrymandering, so deciding how parties are going to carve up the districts, that's where we need to be looking. So that we are getting people into office who will actually support reinstating the Voting Rights Act, not just at the federal level, but state and local as well. And here's the last thing that I'll say. I, I think I said that like two minutes ago. Um, bear with me. I'm on sabbatical, so I have sabbatical. <laughs> I'm reclaiming my time. Um, so on that note, um, the end of this month in October in Detroit, the organizers of the National Women's March are convening the first ever National Women's Convention in Detroit. So I believe it's October 27th through the 29th. 
And it has a twofold purpose, right? So a lot of people were critical about the Women's March of that's nice, but what do you do now, right? Or is it really representative of large numbers of the American people? And so they envision that convention as training. So to get more women to run for office, to uh, channel money so that money does not become a barrier to not just having women run, but having people who are sympathetic and supportive of the issues that disproportionately impact women and families across the country. Because while everyone was lamenting the fact that Hillary Clinton lost the presidential election, people weren't really talking about the significance of Kamala Harris becoming a US senator. Mm -hmm. What it meant to be the second African American woman and the first Indian American woman at the same time to ever be elected to the United States Senate. Or what it meant to have Ilya Isan be the first Muslim woman elected to state office in the country. And so this convention is a way of bringing people together across political stripes to really chart that agenda and create policies that are state level specific, but working within these confines in order to break them down, all right? So I'll stop talking. Was that too depressing? Uh, Not depressing. Was <laughs> <laughs> More wine. <laughs> so, wow. Any thoughts or comments, Ian? Um, I'm aware of the fact that um, Connecticut is one of the uh, states that that people like the Koch brothers and so on want to target to flip, and they actually can. I mean, it, it could happen. We only we only have four seats in the legislature that that need to be flipped, and we have a, a governorship that could be flipped fairly easily. So um, I'm really concerned about how to counteract that kind of pressure. I mean, if it's it seems to me that they're not just it's not just a question of money um, because we've seen many elections where the, the candidate that's lost has actually been the candidate that's had more money. Um, so the, the, and it seems to me that the Koch brothers have had this long strategic plan that they've implemented over a number of years, which involved things like gerrymandering and voter suppression, especially in North Carolina and places like that. And so um, what have they been doing in Connecticut and what can we do to neutralize that, that impact? So because I love stories, let me, so the Koch brothers decided, Koch brothers decided that um, they wanted to champion bipartisan criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. And Connecticut was this great incubator state to do that because we had made all of these reforms, some that people liked, some that people didn't, depending on where they were politically. And so what they did was use Connecticut as a model to say to other states, you should reform your criminal justice system, not because it's bad that we lock people up for decades for minor offenses, but because economically we can't sustain that. Right? So it's an economic argument. And so they were able to channel a lot of money to candidates, to community-based programs, to conferences and conventions to be able to do that. Money is important, and I don't want to underestimate the power and influence of money in our political system. You know, we spent billions upon billions of dollars in dark money last year, where we can't trace the source of that. Um, and you know, Sharon, I was on this morning talking about Puerto Rico, and I thought, wow, we could have spent a fraction of what we devoted toward campaigns last year toward helping people on the island, we wouldn't be having this debate about when will people get power and water. Here's how I think you counter it, and that's enthusiasm. You have to give people something to vote for and not just someone or something to vote against. And that's whether you're talking about local elections. So, you know, I, I live in New Haven. I've been following this mayoral race. So whether you're talking about local elections, state or nationally, organizations need to be on the ground now organizing massive voter registration drives, organizing engagement activity so people can talk about what are the issues, so that it doesn't become predicated based on an individual and a personality of who's running, but that people say we cannot afford not to vote 
in this election. And really, there's no one in this state who can afford not to vote. Mm -hmm. So whether you are the top 1% or you are a struggling working class person, what is at stake is key, but you have to connect them. Political parties don't invest in voter mobilization efforts anymore. They just don't. They just don't feel like it's the payoff. It has to be community-minded and driven to be able to do that. Um, one of the other things that relates to your question about what can be done, I signed a letter um, in May. So I joined with 35 other African-American leaders, women, um, to sign a letter to Tom Perez, who was chair of the DNC. And basically what we said in that letter was, look, you have neglected your most loyal base, mm -hmm. not just as voters, but in terms of how you back people for office, where you direct those campaign resources, contracts, um, voter mobilization efforts. The DNC will face a crisis unless it figures out how to meet people where they are. And that's the kind of thing I, I keep emphasizing, you can't wait. Because the reality is if you wait until an election year, it's too late. Because co brothers have figured out like they bring Republican legislators mm -hmm. across the country to these conferences mm -hmm. twice a year, and they tell them everything from here's how you talk in front of a camera mm -hmm. to here's what you do if you get caught in a scandal and how you spend it. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant strategy, but it's a strategy that can be countered if people do it. Mm -hmm. Have they answered you? Has the DNC answered you? Oh, yes. It was. Uh, <laughs> Kept going right. It was not the part yeah. where they said that they should endorse candidates who aren't necessarily. Yeah, I'm declaring I'm running. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, so. What was the response? Tom Perez was essentially shamed into meeting with us because it went viral, right? People were shocked when they looked at the data. They had no idea, especially because in 2016, the narrative was Hillary Clinton lost because black and brown people didn't go out to vote. Mm -hmm. And so what we were saying was like, no, look at the data. It's much more nuanced than this. So the DNC was shamed into meeting with us. You know, sometimes shame goes a long way. Um, we went to D.C. and had that meeting and, and came out with an action plan for it. And part of that outcome is this women's convention in Detroit, that the DNC should be front and center at encouraging more women to run for elected and appointed office and figuring out how do you infuse uh, issues about gender and sexuality and identity across the board. I won't be running for anything. <laughs> we'll see. So this is, this is great. Um, so we, when we work with really poor people in connecting with health, we a lot of people have health issues. And so we find that it's very rare that those folks or the people who work with them know that they are eligible to vote as long as they're off parole. So they can be on probation, they can vote in Connecticut, that's that's the law. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing to me how many, how few people know that that's the case. So I guess my question is, first of all, nationally, how do we stand in Connecticut? What does that look like? Is that a liberal policy? Is that a good policy? Is that whatever? The second thing is, um, how do you recommend that we kind of regain the narrative on that? Like, because I think the narrative, people are influenced by what they hear about what's happening nationally, that everybody's got, you know, you can't vote because you don't have the right ID, or you can, actually, you can vote if you don't have an ID in Connecticut. You can go to the polls and sign an affidavit and vote, you know. We don't even know for sure if the poll moderators are 100% aware <laughs> of that law, you know. So I guess I guess I'm wondering, I think the, the, the kind of the noise nationally is, is seeping into Connecticut and people assume things that are not true here. And I was just wondering how, you know, what do you have ideas about how to gain and take back control of the narrative? I think it's important. It's an important point about, you know, so I teach intro to American politics and my students groan because I tell them the first day, federalism is my favorite concept. And they're like, who has a favorite concept in politics? <laughs> but by the end of the semester, they get it. They don't share my enthusiasm, but they understand what I'm saying to them. Connecticut is, is considered one of the more progressive states when it comes to um, extending the vote to the formerly incarcerated. I purposely don't use the language right to vote because nowhere in the Constitution do we have an affirmative right to vote, and I think that's key for you know, how we play with the margins of who can and cannot vote. But that's also a fairly recent change for Connecticut. I mean, recent like in the last 15 years, which may not seem like a long time, but given how people perceive our state, it is fairly recent. 
So Connecticut is, is more progressive in terms of allowing people to vote again. Maine and Vermont are the only states in our country that allow people who are currently incarcerated to vote. And that's considered, you know, extreme. Um, and they've shown great numbers about if you give people the notion that they have an investment and a stake in the community, they are less likely to end up back in the system. Mm -hmm. Because now they can see, well, look, I'm paying taxes too. Mm -hmm. And I want to have a say in who gets on the board of education that's going to shape my kids you know, curriculum and their experience in school. So that does have an impact. Part of the challenge for a state like Connecticut is the national noise, which has a lot to do with the, the changes in local media and how you communicate that, right? So if you now have conglomerates controlling your media sources, people in New York don't necessarily care about what's going on in Connecticut unless it affects their bottom line or people in Pennsylvania don't care. So that media piece in terms of being able to communicate has a problem. From an institutional perspective, one of the things that we found is that the people who are supposed to know to communicate to their clients are giving incorrect information. So you have parole and probation officers saying, well, I don't really know, but you probably shouldn't try because if you are found to be in violation, you have now violated the conditions of your release, you've committed a new felony, who wants to go back to prison for trying to vote, right? On top of the fact that if you are someone who's formerly incarcerated, voting is not really priority for you. And so part of the messaging of, of why these things are so tied and are so important are not just for the formerly incarcerated, but for the you know average law-abiding citizen. For them to understand how that punishment affects your voice. Mm -hmm. And not to pit towns against one another, but if you say to people in New Haven, do you see how you're losing out to Cheshire? Yeah. Economically, because with the census coming up, billions of federal dollars are, are decided by the census. Access to mental health services, access to early childhood learning, all based on census numbers. That's when people perk up to say, maybe I should care. But but that census, I mean, how do you change those? You can't change those numbers if you're counting all the uh, people in prison. So it sounds like we need to change that as an inclusive. I mean, how do you change that if that's a, a you know basic so, numbers thing? Barbara, cover your ears. I don't want to look upset. <laughs> <laughs> so this summer, that you know, we some of us get distracted by tweets. <laughs> this summer, the head of the U.S. Census Bureau resigned from his position because one of the things that he wanted to do was change how we, can't, how we count people who are incarcerated. To say the same way we count college students, we count you based on the place to which you plan to return, right? Not where you are right now. So what groups like Prison Policy Initiative and other organizations have been pushing for decades is let's count inmates based on the place they intend to return. Right. So that if you are someone who is arrested in New Haven and you get sent to prison from New Haven, New Haven should still get to count you yeah. in their number. Right. Right? And there was this sort of complicated formula about, well, you know, three-fifths compromise again. What if, you know, New Haven gets to say they have three-fifths of this inmate population and we're going to give infield or Niantic two-fifths of that? That all fell apart. So again, the rules of the game matter. Because it's an easy fix for us to be able to say, let's count people based on where they come from. Now that we have the data and the technology, we track people's movement all the time. So that's a fix. So but it's how a, is that a fix? That's a fix no, it's a possible fix right, in right. terms of counting people based on where they have a place of permanent residency, not the place that they're incarcerated because it shifts population back, and I keep using New Haven just because it, we're here, it shifts population counts back to New Haven that then allows New Haven to get the benefits of that. Right. So right. that if you can show this percentage of our population is um, illiterate, right? We need resources to be able to do that. Right. And each state has their own policy mm -hmm. for how they treat these things and how they divide it up, which makes it even more complicated. So is the is it federally legislated that the census count has to be used as the only way to 
determine districts or could the state like Connecticut say, okay, we get that for census purposes, you refuse to do it differently, mm -hmm. but for purposes of creating our voting districts, we are going to change mm -hmm. the way we do it. Mm -hmm. So what the, the, the policy since 1790 has been that you have to use the census count for your official numbers. But what you do with those numbers can vary based on your state. But here's a challenge, right? I'm gonna pick on, is anyone from Enfield? <laughs> Facebook Live, right? So if I am the representative for, from Enfield, and I know I have three prisons in my district, and I just so happen to also chair the Criminal Justice Committee in the state legislature that makes recommendations, that can change how things are decided, that can go to my friends on the appropriations committee to say, well, how are you going to replace this for us? Because it's not just that you get to count the people in prison, right? you get money from having inmates there. Inmates get visitors. So now you build up an economic development strategy because now you need hotels and you need restaurants and all those things that are there. So it's harder than for me to say, Oh, the goodness of my heart, I'm going to give up my power and my money to do it. Again, why rules are getting mad? Because the people who are now in charge of making the decisions about redistributing power don't want to lose what they have. So the federal government said, well, let's kick it to the states. Okay? Well, if you kick it to the states, then that's why it's so important for people around this table to be a part of that process. Mm -hmm. Because citizens of the state of Connecticut can serve on those boards and commissions and can have those hearings about what the impact will be if we change the district in Bridgeport, which is what happened the last round of redistricting. And it meant that a uh, district in Bridgeport, I can't remember the, the section of it, that had long been um, led by an African-American man, then was up for play and went had the, the threat of going Republican because of the way that it carved up the district. So that happened in Bridgeport, it happened in Hartford, it happened in New Haven. Because people thought, oh, well, you know, just look at numbers and, and play. So. Mm -hmm. I spent a week this summer at math camp. I'm working on this, it, it's literally math camp. Eight in the morning until 10 at night. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a nerd, I'm okay. I've, I've like <laughs> made peace with my plate in life. Um, and so what we were working on is this very issue of what would it look like if you change the margin and who benefits from doing that. I have actually a question that's sort of census related, and this may be a little too far afield for what we're talking about, but since we're in here. I mean, one of the things that keeps me up at night is the fact that the 2020 census will be under the control of the Trump administration, um, which I know is like off in the distance compared to things that could keep me up at night right now, which also keep me up at night. You have to pick and choose. Yeah. But I'm wondering if you have any insight into, I mean, given the power of the administration to shape the kinds of resources that do or do not go into the census effort, or how they go into them, or um, how vigorously they go into them, is there do you have any any console, any words of comfort to offer about that? Or, or and I'm wondering, I guess, I, I mean, a more maybe specific question is whether and how these census commissions that and words that you're describing, is there any, to what extent can they be a check on? Sure, so here's the hope and the glimmer. The Census Commission and that organizing body tends to be nonpartisan. They tend to be driven heavily by numbers and data, right? And so we know that you can interpret numbers and data however you want to, but it gives us a more objective measure than simply other things that could have happened. The real control here lies with Congress and how Congress is going to authorize funding for the census um, to be able to hire people in the community to go out and get people counted and involved. And again, it's why organizations, so whether it's your house of worship, it's your civic group, should be a part of that organizing now. Because then they can exert pressure on Congress to say, look, you might be Republican, you might be a Democrat, but you really want an accurate count. Because it's going to affect the amount of power that you have, Connecticut member of Congress, 
if people are undercounted. So it's funding, it's also the amount of resources, it's the number of districts. So the census is why people don't want statehood for Puerto Rico or for DC, amongst other things. But that's one of the primary reasons. Because if we give statehood to them, then we have to count their people in the census and give them some share of the Electoral College and seats in Congress. Utah doesn't want to give up a seat in Congress to Puerto Rico. So that's where the power lies more so with, the, the, with Congress than with the president. And it's why if the census happens in 2020, next year will be pivotal. Because if you can get people into office who understand the importance of an accurate census, and what it means for all of these other policy-based issues that we care about. I mean, I, it's key, funding for education and funding for mental health. Like, our most vulnerable members of our communities are directly affected yeah. by those census dollars. Even things like transportation funding. But I heard that already been, I mean, in the proposed budget or whatever, for the census dollars have already been significantly slashed. They've been significantly there. slashed for, I was trying to keep them positive. <laughs> they, the, the proposal is to significantly slash funding for the census and also for FEMA, go figure. Right? Mm -hmm. There is a new proposal that would restore some of the funding for, census, for the census and also reward private entities for taking a more active role in getting people counted. I'm a little leery about privatizing prison. public functions, that's you know, someone who studies prisons that always makes me a little nervous. Um, but the fact that it's even on the table and that it's a bipartisan interest now, that for me is the glimmer of hope. If you can get people across parties to take a look at what it'll mean, and it's also why we have to get people in office who understand. We um, tried to pass a bill, I, as I recall, in Connecticut that would take us out of the electoral college, uh, would, uh, the popular vote bill or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, is that actually um, feasible? I mean, can is that up to states to to opt in or out? And what what happens if we opt out? So states determine time, place, and manner of elections. So you can be made in Nebraska who says, "Look, we don't believe in a winner take all. We believe in proportional representation." So if you are Bernie Sanders and you get 20% of the vote, you should get something when it comes to our electoral college votes. You know, you shouldn't, it, it introduces the possibility for third parties to have a chance, but it also makes our elections more competitive because people can't be comforted by the fact that they are one of the two major parties and go. It is possible, and I don't want to offend anyone, it's not feasible. Because again, Connecticut will make the decision for itself, but it will lose power in that overall mm -hmm. landscape, that national compact voting. Um, you know, I've seen now Hillary Clinton has called for abolishing the Electoral College, and a commentator said to me, like, oh, this is sour grape. She's only doing it because she lost. It's, well, you realize she called for this back in 2000 as a U.S. Senator. It's mm -hmm. not new mm -hmm. that she's had these views. Abolishing the Electoral College is more feasible than Connecticut saying we're going to go on our own. So who this. abolishes it? Is it a Congress? Secret? Congress has, it's up to Congress. So again, I said more feasible, right, mm -hmm. on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's more feasible because if Connecticut was to say we're going to totally change the way that we do this, it would have ripple effects that I don't think you would have many legislators say I'm willing to give up that power to do. Mm -hmm. It introduces the possibility that you will have a lot of outside lobbying groups and interest groups flooding money into the state in order to change. And we've already seen some of that in terms of how the legislature was debating that this year um, to preserve those interests. But can you explain, because I, I can't remember, I, when, when Bush didn't get the popular election, I thought that's going to change right away. There's going to be no more electoral college. You know, that system's going to change. That, that's so untenable. Mm -hmm. And that I can remember hearing it explained why some why why it's, it's not in the, why it won't change. Why it's in the counter to the interests of some states to change it. But I don't remember why that is. Why is that? So the this? argument is that it protects smaller states because it at least gives them a voice to be able to do it. But why do right? they get more voice? That, that's what I, I remember it being in smaller states, but why do they yeah. get more why voice with, a, with the electoral 
college votes than they would by popular vote. But so how, how do they get more? One of the, the one of the alternatives to the Electoral College is to say we're going to give each state one vote, right? Congress said routinely that's not going to work. But by, by, why so is we just population though? Why for right? So if I'm one vote per if person. I'm running, then all I would do is play to the interest of Florida, Texas, and California, maybe New York, because they have the population. So it's not like Utah becomes a major player in the presidential election, but you understand that you want to collect as many votes as possible in order to get to that 270, right? That's the argument. I'm not saying that I'm totally convinced by it, um, but that's the argument for it. And I think particularly as we look at the fact that so many Americans now identify as independent, that's a growing population in our country, particularly for millennial voters or for younger voters. How do we discourage third party candidates by having this electoral college system? Um, you know, and again, even when Al Gore, when I was in grad school when that election happened, I remember thinking, we're gonna have to throw out the textbook because we're not gonna have electoral college anymore. It's going to change. That was a blip on the radar. You never had one real bill to reform the electoral college after that election happened in 2000. What you did have was George W. Bush saying, we need to have provisional ballots so that if people go and told they're not on the rolls or they don't have their ID, they can still fill out a ballot. Now there's no um, requirement that that ballot actually gets counted before the election and rarely does it, but that was the kind of reform that we saw, sort of piecemeal incremental not wholesale change. Uh, two questions. One, on the census, is it only for uh, citizens or are we also counting all residents of the US? I think that's important with the whole undocumented issue. And two, if somebody in this room does want to get onto a census commission, what are some uh, practical steps that you would encourage people to take? Great question. So the census counts everyone, it counts residents and citizens alike. It makes a distinction. So it will ask you, ask you your status, which we know is already problematic, right? right? That's why we have such an undercount in the US census. Because if I go to Fairhaven with my, you know, US census <laughs> book bag, right, right, it's a really right. nice bag too, right? With my bag and my badge, and I walk up to people and I say, hi, I'm with the census. Oh, can you tell me your citizenship status? I want to yeah. count. Are you serious? Right. You know, the emails go out. ICE is here. We don't know who this person is. So it means now that what happens if you have a lower budget and you're thinking about, well, we don't know if we're really going to send people to Fairhaven because we understand the community is concerned and the community doesn't trust us because they don't know what our intentions are. So instead we're going to send counters to Westville or we'll send them to you know North Brantford because we think people would be more likely to participate. You have now lost information, not just numbers of who's there, but how people are living that are there. So that's why the census, the, the citizen undocumented distinction is key and also why community organizations need to sign up to lead some of those counts. Mm -hmm. So that you need to have organizations that are um, indigenous and embedded to a community leading that effort because trust is so key across the board, whether it's voter registration or census participation to do that. Um, your second question was about the citizens commissions. If you go to the Secretary of State's website now, um, there should be a section about the census and Connecticut. And it should give you info, it gets updated regularly, but again, we don't have a budget yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that affirmatively, yet. Um, so that's kind of been put off on the back burner. What I also encourage people to go is to go to your elected official, you know, and say, look, I want to be a part of this process, or I want to know who is a part of the process. When you say elected official, would that be federal or I would go to your state official. Because the federal piece, I mean, you know, if I were to go to Blumenthal and say, look, I want to be a part of this process, yeah. oh, that's nice. I don't know who we're going to But if you go to your state elected official, it also puts it on their radar that this is something that you need to happen. 
because they are supposed to have public meetings and public forums to talk about these things. How would organizations um, that, are, that are embedded in the neighborhoods and community sign up to count people? So the US Census will start doing two things. One, they start putting out um, requests for individuals to apply. It's not a lot of money yeah. that you make. You know, a lot of my undergraduates will sign up for it. Uh -huh. So they will put out requests for individuals. They will also put out requests for organizations. Okay. And part of what they do is ask those organizations to volunteer to participate in the count, but to also help get the word out so that people know what is the census. You know, why is it important to participate in the census? I never really understood why that was important yeah. until I started looking at, wow, like there are billions of dollars that get attached right. to these numbers. It's not just we want a picture, but we actually do it. Okay. So the Census Bureau, and if, if you go to their website now, they have a tab there for how you can participate and how you can support. Right, thank you. Yeah. No problem. One last question. I just wanted to share, I, I was, um, the last census I was part of it when I was for the yeah, charity. That's how we got to where I was with the client, mm -hmm. the educated them. And it, it means something yeah. when you as an, a, a service provider, whatever that service is, can say to your clients, this is why this is important for you and for us and for a community because it is tied to these, these things. And the, the piece to me that is important about the census, about the Voting Rights Act, it's not just about voting and participating for the sake of doing it. This really has an impact on quality of life for people and the things that I think a lot of us take for granted about what this means when you're fighting over resources and fighting over voice. Any last comments on that? Go vote. <laughs> no senses. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. And I can uh, encourage you. There's still some food. There are dark chocolate chef brownies. <laughs> we have to have them. But we did have a couple people join us who did not introduce themselves. I don't know if you guys want to jump in, maybe, Jana. Sure, I'm Jenna. <laughs> I'm Jenna. I'm chair of the Bus for Women and Girls. And hey, lady. I snuck in. And I uh, work at All Our Kin. And that's why I was asking about the Census Bureau. I'm Kim Bowen. I'm a um, nonprofit consultant. I'm Mary Beth Kongman. I am on the advisory board for the fund for women girls. Um, uh, Nan Birdwhistle. I'm a, a municipal attorney with the law firm Martha Kalina, former chief elected official, and spent a lot of time working to try to get uh, great women elected, and also on the grants committee for women and girls. Yeah, and I wonder, um, we have two very special moms here, we have two very special daughters, and I wondered if you would comment on that experience, please. Could you describe, talk about Margo? <laughs> Lily? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> sure. Um, so my daughter, Lily James, was fortunate to be on the Grants Review Committee for Women and Girls for two or three years, I think, two or three years. Um, and it was really formative for her. She's a freshman at um, Mount Holyoke College thinking about women's studies as a major. She um, has kind of come into her feminism and her polit political self, I think, largely through this experience. And um, it was a fantastic opportunity. And she learned a lot about the um, challenges of grant making and <laughs> philanthropy <laughs> and um, a lot about wonderful organizations and great entertainment. So it's fabulous. Was, uh, she's about, she's almost 14, so when she did this, she was 15. Um, she's now a uh, high school freshman. And it seemed to have been a great experience just sitting around a table and deliberating with such amazing women. And I, I hope she does it again. And I think the other thing is that I'm a big believer in um, talking about resources and money 
with young people so they understand yeah. about resource allocation decisions because that's a lot of I mean you were talking a lot about that today mm -hmm. how these processes work and it's, so it's a great way to um, it has it was for her I think to start to look at that you know how are you know how are these decisions being made who gets what and why so it's the underpinning of a lot in our in our society this is like a great microcosm of, of how, how how it can work well I think Thank you both, because uh, Lily and Marco are uh, very important parts of the Grants Committee. Um, we try and recruit young women early, about eighth grade, and hope to keep them through high school. Sometimes we get lucky and keep them through college. Um, really important voices on the table. Many of the requests of the fund have to do with services for mm -hmm. teens and tweens and young women, and uh, who better than young women to, to inform it. So. Thank you very much for lending us your daughters. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have another one. Oh, we have an evaluation, if you could take a few moments. And fill it out for us. We're we'll be planning the twenty thirty budget. Thank you. 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 Thank